Name that dude? Jessica. Aye. The Alman uh, Alman brother. Oh, uh, oh, check out the other stuff you downloaded on my PC <laughs> with the other all those songs, that album. What pretty, that's when you gave me a, uh, a video for the presentation. Yeah. Pretty good. That wasn't on that list. No, I just listened to that. Okay. That wasn't on that list. Here we are, right? Um, week four. Um, I have not yet posted the quiz for readings quiz two. I'll post that soon. <coughs> uh, homework one has been posted. Um, let's see. I did not record lecture one on on from last week, and then Zoom did something weird. Where I, I had posted links, but then the links started requiring students to log in or something like that. So I said, forget all that nonsense. So I um oh, wait, come on. I see my um so I just posted the video to you. Bunch of videos on YouTube, which is nice because you can speed it up and do all the things you want to do. So uh, the two watch videos are posted to YouTube. That's what it does mean that it's going to take me an extra minute to uh, to upload videos going forward. Did I hit record? Hey, did. Um, I'm recording. Um, I'm recording. Okay, good. Um, let's see what else. That's for week two. Actually, this McCloskey reading, not so relevant. I, I got my courses confused. So um, the marginal cost of reading that has something to do with encroaching on uh, land that does not belong to this class. Okay. Um, here's week four. Uh, we're going to continue your review of micro topics, read chapter four of your textbook. Also, read this paper by Tullock, uh, Welfare Costs of Tariffs, Monopoly, and Theft. This is one of the two seminal papers on rent seeking. Most of you should be familiar with what rent seeking is, but uh, this is kind of where the, the research on rent seeking got started um, in 1967. Sounds like a long time for some of you, but it's not. But the idea that uh, this concept of rent seeking is relatively new is interesting. There's been a lot of research on rent seeking since. I think it's fascinating stuff. Other stuff um, Marginal Revolution is a really cool blog. I really like reading it. Um, there's always something interesting on here. Tabak Cowan and Alex Tabak keep this together. Oh, this is fun. Did you guys see this? This bridge that totally collapsed while there was a bus on it. So far as scary. Um, it's funny because it was the same day that uh, that Biden was supposed to go and see that same town to talk about infrastructure. Ah ha ha. Okay. Um, let's go back to this. This. Okay. Um, any logistical issues right now? Questions about stuff? Yes. Um, for the homework number one, there's no spot to submit it on Canvas. Ooh, thank you. Okay, I'll have to fix that. I will get on that. Thank you. Report. We have been walking through sort of the perfectly competitive 
model of the firm and the firm's decision. It's helpful to remember that the firm will need the market price as it emerges in the market as a price taker. And this price becomes the demand curve faced by the particular firm. In the atomistic model, each firm is so small that they cannot affect market prices. So they take market prices as a given. And from, from this demand curve, which is also the marginal revenue curve, which is also the average revenue curve. Can you explain why? In words, you should be able to think that through, maybe work that through with the classmate. Why is that demand curve also the marginal revenue curve and also the average revenue curve? We say that this demand curve is perfectly elastic. The price is the same no matter the quantity. And then we read on to this graph our marginal cost curve, our average um, variable cost curve, and our average total cost curves. And, and if this firm is earning zero profits, then, then the average total cost curve will intersect with the marginal cost curve at the demand curve. So all three lines will intersect at the same point. Okay. Now, this firm will choose to continue to produce in the long run, so long as its average total costs are at least equal to marginal revenue at the point where it intersects with the marginal cost. However, in the short run, this firm may choose to produce even if, for some reason, let's say supply in the market increases. So supply in the market increases such that the new price is below the average total cost curve. In this case, the firm will continue to produce in the short run, even though it is experiencing losses. It'll continue to produce because, even though it's experiencing some losses, it is still able to cover its variable costs in the short run and make some payments towards its total costs in the short run. In other words, if this firm chose not to produce, then it would not be able to make any payments towards its total costs and thus would be suffering even greater losses than if it chose to continue to produce. Does that make sense to you? Right. As long as it's covering more than its variable costs, it's able to make some payments towards its, its fixed costs. Now, the fixed costs, it has to pay whether it operates or not. So if it can make some payments towards its fixed costs, it will still continue to operate so that its losses are minimized. We want to maximize profits and minimize losses. However, if the price were to fall, so far, let's have the demand curve shift this time, that even the variable costs are below the marginal revenues. At this point, the firm would just choose to shut down and instead of incurring those variable costs, simply pay its fixed costs. In that way, in that way, it would again be minimizing its losses. So there's the, the shutdown condition in the short run is if the price falls below the variable cost curve. Okay. So 
Suppose our firm is producing in a competitive market. And it discovers a new method of production. A new method of production such that its total costs are decreased. This firm is now experiencing what? Straightforward. Marginal revenue is greater than average total costs. Where does this firm choose to produce? The firm continues to choose to produce where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. The quantity decision is always determined by the intersection of, our, of marginal cost and marginal revenue, not based upon averages. This firm will choose to produce this quantity. And at that quantity, for every unit that it produces, it captures this revenue. And for every unit that it produces, the average cost is this. As a result, this region can be described as what? Profits. That region is the profits that are being earned by the firm. Now, a firm will have an incentive to put into operation any, any innovation that will reduce its costs. However, the firm will prefer not to make that innovation public. As long as it maintains knowledge that is not available to the rest of the market, it has the opportunity to capture these profits. The supply curve for the market is constituted by all of the firms in the market together. And it's actually the, the sum of all of the marginal cost curves for all of the firms in the market. The sum of the marginal cost curves are what give us the supply curve. Are you with me? Okay. So then this firm is able to produce a larger quantity at the same cost, or it's able to produce the same quantity and capture the difference as profits. So long as the information about this innovation is not made public, all the other firms are going to continue to producing at the same level. However, if this innovation becomes known by other producers, what happens to the supply curve? Yeah. Ships to the right. It'll ship to the right. Each of their cost curves will be moving at the same time. And so the sum of the cost curves, right, will result in a shift in the supply curve. When all of the firms are able to take advantage of this new lower cost approach to producing, it shifts the supply curve. And as a result, the new market price decreases. When the market price decreases, it whittles away the profits of the firm that had the new innovation. Now this firm is only earning these profits. It's a lot of its profits. Are you still with me? Okay. Who's made better off as a result? Consumers. Yes. Go ahead. Consumers. Consumers are. Can you show me? How would you show that consumers are made better off? It's a lower price. The price is lower, and therefore the consumer surplus is no longer just this area. 
but this trapezoid is added to the consumer surpluses. So consumers will make better off. Can we, how do we measure the increase in consumer surplus in the real world? Yes. Disposable income. That's a good answer. Uh, so if, if this is a, if this good or service is something that everybody purchases, right? And then as a result of, of the price falling, they now all have more disposable income to spend on other things. That's good. Um, we don't know exactly the shape of this demand curve. The shape of that demand curve is, is not known, particularly when we get to the extremes. Can't know what the demand curve looks like there. And we don't really know what the demand curve looks like in this region. Actually, I often do this, we'll go ahead and do it again. When, when economists look at real-world markets, in order to identify a demand curve or a supply curve, what data do we actually have available to us? Where do we get the data to construct or estimate a demand curve? Yes. Does it come from the margin utility curve? No, the marginal utility curve is also just sort of in our minds somewhere. What real world data do we have available to us to help construct the demand curve? Yeah. Can it just be like how much of something is purchased? And what cost it's purchased at? And at what price? In other words, we have these artifacts. We have this many units were purchased at this price, this many units were purchased at this price. This many units were purchased at this price, and so on and so forth. You see, the the price quantity pairs that are revealed in actual real world market interactions are artifacts. In the same way that an archaeologist looks at artifacts to try to construct some understanding of a society, or in the same way that a historian reads old documents in order to try to understand what happened in the past, the economist has available to herself merely these artifacts of exchanges that have occurred at some time in the past. Are these artifacts, are these artifacts evidence of the supply curve or of the demand curve? Yes. So then which lines do I want to connect to draw my supply curve? And which, which lines do I want to connect to show my demand curve? Yes. Oh boy. And, and, and so if I run a regression on this scatter plot, what, what coefficients am I going to get on my regression? Are they going to be positive or negative? Yes, right? we don't we don't know. <laughs> so, so from the economist's point of view, we get this smattering of data points where actual transactions have obtained. What about up here? What kind of uh, data do we have up here on this part of the graph? No data. Ain't nobody paying that much for one of these things. There's no data up here. What about down here? There's no data down there, and nobody's selling for that little. Similarly, there's no data down here, no data down here. So when, when the economist thinks about what's actually happening here, you kind of have to draw right, our line of best fit for the demand curve, and our line is of best fit for the supply curve, and then confidence intervals around each of those. Are you with me? such that, where is the equilibrium point? Here-ish, kind of. Here-ish, kind of, right? We don't, we don't know for sure. It's really hard to tell. Again, I'm trying to pull the rug out from under the economists, okay? Try to keep us humble about what we can know. 
So, so in the in the real world, there's not perfect information about a particular price that everything is purchased and, and, and sold at. Now, gold is is a counterexample because there's a spot price for gold at any point in time. The the, the market for gold is very sensitive, right? highly elastic, very very sensitive to changes. So it might get a tighter fit around gold. It might get a tighter fit around oil at any given point in time. Although even oil markets can be completely upside down sometimes. It happened a year and a half ago, I think. Oil futures markets flipped and went bananas. Okay. Okay. So then all of the market participants at any given point in time are, are making their best guess as to what price to charge. Now, what, what, what a particular firm who has some power about choosing price would prefer to do is to have a good idea of what the demand curve is. And the best that uh, any particular firm can know is when I charge this price, I sold this many units. And then the firm can experiment. The firm can experiment and say, well, I could lower my price and see if by lowering my price, I sell more units. Right? Okay. Now, this has to assume that everything else in the entire world has stayed the same. That the availability of close substitutes to this good or service remains the same. That the Prices of all complementary goods have remained the same. That for consumer preferences and income has remained the same. Right? In other words, we have to assume that the demand curve hasn't moved at all. How often does the demand curve hold still? Oh, it just changed again. It does not hold still. But the best we can do is guess. Now, the firm, after experimenting with this price and this price, Oops. And observing the change in, in quantities that results, how will it decide whether it has made a good decision or a bad decision? How will it determine whether it has made a good decision or a bad decision? Let's see if it made more profit. Before we get to profit, we want to know something else. Revenue. Yeah, we can just measure our revenue. We can measure our total revenue. The total revenue for, for a firm for its, its sale of any good is the price quantity combination, right? The area inside of that rectangle. When the firm chooses to lower its price, right, it's giving up this rectangle. It will, it will believe that it has done well if in exchange for giving up this rectangle, it captures this rectangle. If this rectangle is larger than that rectangle, right, then revenues will have increased. Where will the revenues be the greatest? Along this demand curve, where will revenues be greatest? We can experiment a little bit. We can draw a big old demand curve. We have a nice long skinny triangle here. Okay. Revenues here will actually be rather low. <coughs> Similarly, revenues in a long, in a short cut rectangle will also be rather low. Where will revenues be greatest? Somewhere around the middle, right? Somewhere around the middle. And actually, we say that they are the greatest at what is called the unit elastic point along the demand curve. Unit elastic, that sounds like elasticity snow. Yup. Along any given demand curve, there is some portion of the demand curve that is elastic and some portion of the demand curve that is inelastic. 
And then right in the middle of the demand curve is the unit elastic point. <coughs> is that true if the, the demand curve is straight up and is, is more steep? Yep. Unit elastic point is still right there. This is the biggest rectangle that we can inscribe within that triangle. How do we identify, how do we remember this? Well, I like to say that you can draw your demand curve and it kind of looks like the letter A. Then you can put an E up here for the elastic region, an I down here for the inelastic region, draw an O at the middle and call that the unit elastic point, A, E, I, O, U. Now you've identified the different regions of your demand curve, which portions are elastic and inelastic. If a firm, if a firm reduces its price and finds that, and finds the elasticity, the arc elasticity between the two points, and finds that the elasticity is inelastic, it will know that it has it has reduced its total revenues. Now, if somebody said, well, you're going to want to think about total profits, and that's right. And that's right, because the cost curve becomes relevant here. But I wanted to touch on the elasticities here for just a moment. We're going to come back to elasticities a bit more. We'll remind ourselves of the formula for elasticities. So. Now, we'll come back to this story for just a minute. This story is what Deirdre McCloskey and Art Cardin call, leave me alone and I'll make you rich. Leave me alone and I'll make you rich. Does anybody remember that story and how it works? How it pieces together? I've used this example many times before. The idea is that if we allow innovators the opportunity to try a new thing, a new method of production or an invention of a new product. If we allow them the opportunity to try, then in the short run, they're going to capture huge profits. They'll capture huge profits because they have discovered a new low cost mechanism for production. However, they can't keep that new innovation secret forever. Maybe Maybe their ability to be more productive has something to do with something peculiar about themselves. What if they're just better at it than everyone else is? In that case, they will continue to earn profits. Competitors by entering won't be able to do any better than them. In that case, we would say that that person has a rent or a property, has a property in that skill or in that production process. For example, right? King James has a very particular set of skills he's able to capitalize on. Are you with me? Similarly, Liam Neeson has a very particular set of skills, right? He's able to make use of those, whether it's just him as an actor or him playing the character in tape. As a result, he's able to continue to capture those profits because nobody else can enter in and compete those away. But for most production processes, and for most of us, you're not that special. I know that's the opposite of what I'm supposed to tell students, that I'm supposed to give you all a participation trophy, and I will. And some of them will have the letter F written on them, but <laughs> thank you for participating. I think you should do something different. For most of us, we have to compete. Now, one thing that's interesting to me about this story is that Economists love to point to the increase in consumer surpluses. However, in the short run, right, and sometimes the short run can be your whole life. In the short run, the person who knew how to use this old production process and might not ever be able to use the new production process. And if that's the case, this person is out of business permanently and their life sucks. They become poor. So in, in the early ages of the Industrial Revolution, 
There were people who wove cloth by hand. They had looms and they would weave these cloths to, to get textiles and they would weave them by hand. Along came somebody who invented a mechanical loom. And that mechanical loom made it possible for one worker to produce 10 times as much cloth as before. Well, the people who were hand weavers were pissed by this, were pissed by this introduction of com competition that they could not keep up with, and so they decided to destroy all of the mechanical looms. Throughout human history, it has been more often the case that new entrants have been prevented from entering by incumbent interests, such that new innovations and new technologies have not been allowed an opportunity to be introduced into the marketplace. And as a result, economic growth has been curtailed and cut short. It was not until the early 1800s that it became more and more common for the rest of society to tell innovators, you may have a go. You can go ahead and try your new innovation, even if it displaces existing workers. However, in popular culture, the introduction of new technologies and new innovations is still frowned upon because it is much more prescient to, to feel the displacement that happens in the short run. So we get songs like, like uh, Johnny Cash's John Henry, right? About the steam driving uh, hammer, hammer machine compared to John Henry the hammer swinger, right? Who, who could drive, he could lift a truck and he could hoist a jack, he could pick and shovel too, he could do anything, you hire him too, All right? We only get economic growth of the kind that we've experienced in the last 200 or so years by allowing, by allowing innovators the opportunity to enter. This is not really captured perfectly in economic theory other than the way I've described it here. And those new innovations cannot be counted upon. They are somewhat serendipitous. We do not know that somebody will have a new innovation. We do not know if the new innovation will actually benefit everyone. It's a bit of a puzzle still. Oftentimes, a business will charge an above market clearing price. Oftentimes, we will see businesses and, and, and even an entire industry's worth of businesses. Each firm All of the firms within an industry might be capturing profits. Sometimes this is true because buyers are ruthless. Buyers are ruthless. In what ways are buyers ruthless? I do not tell my grocer a week ahead of time. I'd like to buy a leg of lamb. I cooked a leg of lamb this weekend. I, uh, I smothered it with mustard and leeks and garlic, and rosemary and mint, and salt and pepper. Put it in a couple of Ziploc baggies, gallon sized. Hit the sous vide button on my instant pot. Let it come up to about 110 degrees. Took it out of that, laid it on my grill, my um, broiling pan, stuck it under the broiler for five minutes on each side, came out a perfect 130 degrees, sliced it nice and thin. Perfection. We should have been there. Didn't get a hand block. Didn't. 
I don't regret that either. <laughs> I didn't tell my grocer ahead of time that I was coming to buy a leg of lamb. However, if I got to the grocery store and went to get a leg of lamb and did not find it there, what would I do? I would fire my grocer. You're fired. You did not have what I wanted to be there when I got there. You're fired. Right? Which is silly. Just go to a different grocery store. But that's what I mean by your fire, right? Okay. However, the grocer doesn't know whether I'm coming or not either. And so he stocks that leg of lamb, hoping that someone will come to buy it. And he has to mark up the price of that leg of lamb based upon the probability or the expected value that anybody comes to buy it. And so most firms in competitive industries charge an above market clearing price for their products, not because they're monopolists, but because if they do not, they will definitely be losing money. We cannot look at the atomistic interaction at any given point in time to say whether or not a firm is behaving monopolistically or not. We have to look at its costs over time see whether it's actually being successful at that. Why do I bring this up? Because it will be the case that prosecutors will try to accuse a firm of behaving monopolistically by charging a markup price that is too great. Baloney. Yeah. So is that like a way of avoiding, I would say, markup prosecution or whatnot? So like um, price match guarantees? Well, it's one way of saying, instead of like firing your grocer, you can compare it against a competitor so you stay there with your grocer. So now you complicated this. Okay, well, my bad. That's good. That's good. That's good. So, so first of all, the, the, the individual grocer might be charging an above market clearing price simply because it has to deal with this inventory problem, right? So when, when they are prosecuted by an antitrust agency, the economists have figured this out and, and are able to explain. Can I help you fellas? We're trying to decipher your yeah. graph. Okay, what's confusing? Just the point on the average total cost. Is it because it's uh, like past where it intersects with the marginal cost curve? That's right. That's right. So to, to be extremely clear, So long as the firm is producing and earning profits, right, the, the quantity that it chooses to produce will wind up on the upward swinging side of the average total cost curve. Because the bottom has to be where the marginal cost curve intersects, but the marginal cost curve continues to incline after that point. And so this, this point will always be somewhat above the bottom of the average total cost curve. Thank you for that clarifying question. Um, so economists have explained to antitrust divisions, right, that it makes sense for there to be some markup involved here. It appears like they're capturing profits in the short run, but when we balance it out across all the other products that the grocer has to sell, and the fact that if it doesn't sell this leg of lamb early enough, it's going to have to reduce the price below, probably, its average total cost curve, somewhere above its average variable cost curve, so that it just gets it off the shelf and it doesn't throw it away completely. Then you mentioned price match guarantees. Ah, now price match guarantees could be another way for antitrust prosecutors, right, to accuse a set of firms for behaving anti-competitively like a cartel. So if you're if, if you're having a price match guarantee, then that is a way for firms to monitor each other's pricing. And in so monitoring, they can collude easier. So if firms are, are operating under a price matching scheme. It is more likely that 
if they're able to collude, the overall price will be above the market clearing price. Man, the legend, Tom Harris. He's been there longer than Cecil. So she didn't think that was possible. <laughs> So the, the grocer has to respond by carrying an inventory, and that inventory reflects the imperfect knowledge. Again, we're back to that fuzzy demand curve and fuzzy supply curve. Having an inventory means there's stuff being employed, economizing on information costs. So there's a, a, a fire extinguisher somewhere in this building. I hope not too far away. There it is. You're not that window, right? Is that fire extinguisher currently being employed? Hell yeah, it is. If it weren't there, I'd be scared. Right? I'm, not, I'm not spraying anything out of it. It doesn't have to be efficient if it's not being actively used right at the moment. Sometimes we want to have an inventory of a thing. Some of you have an inventory in shoes. That is definitely out of, out of control. You don't need those many shoes. Oh, it does. <laughs> Now, I mentioned that the marginal cost curve is similar to the supply curve for the individual firm. Of course, each firm might have a different average variable cost curve, and each firm might have a different marginal cost curve. If I were to take these two firms and sum up their marginal cost curves in order to get a market supply curve, I would only really take this firm above its average variable cost curve to start the calculation of its marginal cost curve, to, to calculate the, the, the total market supply curve. And then once the price gets higher, I would add this plus this and thereby get the total market supply curve. The more firms that I add into the overall market, right, the more continuous this line becomes. And I end up getting something that's a lot more like a straight line or, or a continuous curve at any rate for the supply curve. Does that make sense to you? The supply curve for the entire market is the horizontal summation of the marginal cost curves, not the vertical summation of the marginal cost curves. Why does the firm choose to produce where it chooses to produce? What if this firm chose to produce fewer units? This firm then would be incurring costs greater than revenues per units, and this would represent losses. What if the firm chooses to produce over here? Well, again, the costs would be above revenues, and, and if it chooses to produce in this range, it would have even greater losses. Overestimating production can be even more harmful than underestimating production. It really is aiming for this spot as best as it can. Okay. This is not the price that it charges. This is the cost that it is incurred per unit. So it's capturing losses in that range. Now, let's see. So price is an indicator. Okay. 
why, why is this ideal that price is equal to marginal cost? Price tells us what? Price is an indicator of the value that society places on a good being produced. The price is the indicator, the best that we have of an indicator as to whether or not somebody else wants you to make the thing that you are making. The marginal cost is the value that society places on the resources that are being used to produce the good. In other words, the marginal cost is the opportunity cost. You have to bid away those variable inputs from any other use of those inputs in order to use them to make whatever it is that you want to make. And bidding those resources away from somebody else is to cover their opportunity cost of using those inputs. It measures the sacrifice of resources that have to go towards the production of the good being produced. If the firm chooses to produce only at this quantity, the marginal cost would be well below the marginal revenue. The average total cost would be above it. Society would say, be saying, make more. Now, make sure you understand this carefully. It is not the manager of the firm that is saying make more. It is society telling the manager of the firm, we want you to make more. We don't want you to experience losses. Losses represent a waste of resources. To whom? Primarily to the entrepreneur, to the decision maker. But those losses are, in a sense, a negative externality to everyone else in society who might be wanting to make something else. You use these resources to make a car. We don't want the car. You get losses. But in the meantime, we also don't get the Vespas we really wanted to scoot around on. We don't get the thing that we actually wanted. You did poorly, you did bad, and you should feel bad too. Okay. That is how we discipline producers in the marketplace. So the incentive is for the firm to produce the appropriate quantity. If producing the appropriate quantity, they minimize their losses or they maximize their profits and they maximize the benefits to the rest of society. Okay. This is the perfectly animistic firm. The perfectly animistic firm exists along a spectrum of potential industry structures. All the way to the far left, we have the perfectly competitive firm or the atomistic market with many, many buyers and many, many sellers. At the other end of the spectrum, what might we have? A pure monopoly. One step away from a pure monopoly, we might have what? Two firms in an industry. What do you call that? A duopoly. A duopoly. Du 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 okay. A duopoly. And then somewhere in this range, you might have what? An oligopoly. Relatively few firms that can somehow collude with one another, that can somehow collude with one another, right? If they can become a perfect cartel, then that cartel will behave as if it were a pure monopoly. The fewer the firms there are, the fewer the people that have to be coordinated with to get there, so the more likely it is that it behaves like a pure monopoly. And then sort of in this range, we have something called monopolistic competition. The important thing to recognize about these different fir firm kinds of structures or industry structures is that only at the perfectly competitive end do we observe 
firms each independently responding to a flat marginal revenue curve. Under any of the other forms of, of market structure, the representative firm will observe something of a downward sloping demand curve. Whenever a firm is facing a somewhat downward sloping demand curve, we say that the firm is no longer a price taker, but instead we say that this firm is a price searcher. Because the firm is a price searcher, it does not necessarily mean that it is a monopolist or that it is behaving anti-competitively. It just simply means that the structure of the market is such that firms face a downward slipping demand curve and therefore have some ability to make decisions based upon price. Pick up there next time. Thank you.